Sometimes you hang in that precipitous moment when you're trying to figure which of the two stories that you prepared for today is the story to go. Uh, when I was growing up as a, as a child, I had a lot of experiences of what I would call the perfect anticipatory Christmas. You know, you just prepared and you prepared and it was so exciting on Christmas Eve. You went to bed and ooh, it was very exciting and you couldn't sleep at night. And, you know, uh, dad who always, uh, you know, uh, poor dad was trying to get some shut eye, you know, who knows what kinds of things he had to assemble in the night uh, until the last possible moment. Um, including the fact when I was growing up, Santa brought the tree. So there was no tree in our house when we went to bed on Christmas Eve. And on Christmas morning, Santa had brought and decorated the tree, amazingly using our decorations. Uh, I guess Santa knows where everyone hides the decorations. But Ever since then, and over a lifetime, you keep trying to reclaim those Christmases, I think, that you remember as the perfect Christmas. And so we prepare and we rush around and we imagine maybe if we do one more thing or fit one more thing or cook one more thing or uh, if we try to do one more thing, I notice that one more thing just keeps coming up because there's always one more thing to do. There are so many things in our world to prepare us for Christmas. So many people to buy for, so much that requires our attention. Well, as we come to this season, it seems to me that it's important for us to kind of talk about the game plan. How would it be best for us to prepare for Christmas? Now, I chose as the reading for today, or it was chosen for me in many ways, because I'm actually following in what is the most unusual sense for me, at least in recent years. I am following the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a group of readings that are prescribed for each Sunday of the year. And in this new Christmas year, I am reading to you from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Now, as I read this to you, I want you to hear this for what it is. Uh, Israel has experienced exile and is broken. And it's hard for them to imagine things are ever going to be right again. They are just messed up. They are imagining the perfect. They're imagining, well, if they celebrated Christmas, and they were Hebrew people, so they didn't. But if they celebrated Christmas, they would be imagining the perfect tree with the beautiful decorations. My Aunt Jean used to have three different trees, and each one had a different theme in parts of her house. One was the blue and silver tree, and one was the gold and silver tree, and one was the family tree, which had all sorts of cheesy decorations and was hidden. You know, the, the family tree was hidden, um, uh, at least as I remember it anyway. It was the pretty trees that were out. Uh, but I was always intrigued by the things that my cousin Ricky and cousin, cousin Billy had made him for that tree that were hanging on it. Um, so imagine you're longing for the perfect, but that you're struggling before the perfect comes. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak compassionately to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her compulsory service has ended that her penalty has been paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double. A voice is crying out, clear the Lord's way in the desert. Make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level and rough terrain a valley plain. The Lord's glory will appear and all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. A voice was saying, call out. And another said, what should I call out? All flesh is grass, all its loyalty is like the flowers of the field. The grass dries up and the flower withers when the Lord's breath blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass dries up, the flower withers, but our God's word will exist forever. And then this to proclaim in verse 9, Go up on a high mountain, messenger Zion. 
Raise your voice and shout, messenger Jerusalem. Raise it. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here is your God. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, as I thought about the way we prepare for Christmas, and I thought about, I thought about this passage that I have read in seasons past, in Christmas seasons past, for years and years and years. I always thought it was about the need to conquer stuff out there. Knock down mountains that are out there. Knock down valleys that are out there. Make the path straight that's out there. When I discovered this season, as I sat in reflection over this passage now for weeks, actually, it occurs to me that the most crooked path and way to God is in my own heart. I have spent years laying up all sorts of impediments to my experience of God. All of the voices that I hear from my childhood that say to me uh, about that I'm not quite good enough, I'm not quite tall enough, I'm not quite handsome enough, I'm not quite whatever smart enough, all of those kinds of things. All the voices of insecurity and brokenness and uncertainty that I've lived with at various points in my life, the, the voices that say you could always do more, you could always be more, you could always hope for more, you are not enough. Keep calling out to me and making the path that's so crooked, it's amazing I'll ever find a way to the Lord. Because inside me, I have built mountains between me and God. I have dug valleys between me and God. And God wants to level that playing field. Because God wants to run like he did to the, to the wayward son. Down, see me coming and run to me. Only I've put all these blockages between me and God. I've spent a lifetime thinking, I, I just if I work a little bit harder, I can deserve you, God. If I do things just a little bit righter, if I preach just a little bit more perfect of a sermon that really just lifts everyone up so that you all are actually levitated out of your seat and are floating right here in front of me because of the power of the Holy Spirit, then, then... What will I do next week? <laughs> then, uh, you know, uh, you'll all come back waiting and it won't happen. The challenge for us is we keep building things up in some uncertain future instead of being present right now and trusting that God is here with us in this moment. How does, how do, what are the four words that are used to end this proclamation that Isaiah makes? Here is our God. Here. Not over there. Not somewhere down the road. Not in some unseen future. Our God is here. That doesn't mean we shouldn't work towards a beautiful future, but it starts now. It's not about punching our ticket to heaven. It's about living like heaven's all around us right now. It's living in the kingdom right now. And in order to do that, I am convinced that the best way to help you prepare for Christmas is to ask you to do something really important. Oh, great. James is going to ask us to do some more. One more thing. One more thing. The one more thing I want to ask you to do at Christmas is let go. Let go of all the expectations that there has to be a perfect tree. Because guess what? Ain't no such thing. There has never been nor will there ever be a perfect tree. Unless it's God makes it, and I guess it could be a perfect tree then. But, and God makes everything, so I guess every tree is perfect just the way that it is. But really, the idea of perfection is something that doesn't come to the New Testament. From the Old Testament, the understanding was good. You didn't ever see God make the world and look at it and say, that's perfect. Oh, that's perfect. That's, that's perfect. That's very perfect. God said, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's very good. You are already embodying the goodness of God somewhere deep inside that God wants to release from you. If you seek to follow him, if you let go of all of the stuff that you've... You know, sometimes it's the church that's put all this stuff. We've got all this list of things that we've got to do before Christmas can come. 
I want to tell you that some of my sisters and brothers think I'm a whack job because I do not follow the lectionary. You know, that the lectionary, is, there's a, it's there for a reason. It's, it's there for a reason. I need to preach the lectionary. And as soon as you make any rule, the tantamount rule, you've lost it. You've become a Pharisee. We don't need any more of those. But we've got plenty of them. <laughs> I'm standing here in front of you, probably the chief Pharisee at St. James. I have got rules. I try to talk about how I don't have any rules, and I let you do what you want to do, but I don't. I have rules, rules, rules. Come to my kitchen. Touch things that you're not supposed to. Touch the Toji Rushi. Oh, my goodness. The rice maker, and you will be in deep kimchi. Yes. You, too, can be uh, ancient vegetables buried underground. But the truth is, if we're all honest with ourselves, sometimes we all are rule makers. If Christmas is going to be right, we can't come into the Christmas room until it's 7 a.m. So we have to wait until 7 a.m. Why? I don't know, because someone did that last year, and somehow it's miraculously the best time to come in. 7 o'clock is when the perfect light sneaks in from the west and the east and the north and the south, and the tree is just lighted a certain way. Only come in at 7. If 7 doesn't work, try 7.06. 7.06 is just right. You know, uh, the truth is... We make all these rules, and in the end, as long as we hold on to those rules, we build mountains and valleys between us and God. God just wants us to love God, and God just wants to love us. The whole story of Christmas is, I love you. The whole story of Christmas, if we were going to encapsulate it completely, I love you. I love you so much, I am emptying myself. I am completely emptying myself. This is, this is the story, this is the most, perhaps one of the most ancient hymns of Christianity is in uh, Philippians 2. God, you know, Jesus is God, but he didn't choose equality with God as something to hold on to, but emptied himself, emptied himself. And that is the journey of faith, letting go. Letting go of all the things you think you have to do in order to have Christmas. You have to bake Aunt Gertrude's purple cookies. I, you know, it does not matter what else happens in your life, how many tragedies or craziness. If you don't make Aunt Gertrude's purple cookies, it's not going to be Christmas. Christmas will come whether you make Aunt Gertrude's purple cookies or not. Maybe you don't have a Aunt Gertrude, and maybe she doesn't have purple cookies. But I bet you somewhere in the world, there's somebody has got an Aunt Gertrude that makes some kind of cookie they got to make in order for it to be Christmas. For years, my grandmother made Christmas bread every year. My mom's mom. And then mom made Christmas bread every year the way grandmommy told her she had to make Christmas bread. And you know what? I have found since I have been married to Linda and we lived far away from there and there was no Christmas bread, that Christmas still came. Can you believe it? There was no Christmas bread. There was no Aunt Gertrude's purple cookies. There, I don't have an Aunt Gertrude nor do we have purple cookies. But Christmas is coming. You see, the thing is, it's already come. And it's coming again and again as Jesus is born in us over and over. Christ is constantly seeking a place to be born. And you are the fertile ground God wants to be born in. God wants to come to life in the way that we love and treat the world in which we live. God is a God of Incarnation. I really hate using that word. It's a very churchy word, and it just means God pitches a tent, and it's a tent that looks like Marge, or it looks like Chris, or it looks like Craig. It looks like Tom, or Mike, or even James, either one of us. It looks like us. Because God loves us. You don't need to add anything to make Christmas great. Christmas is already great because Christmas is. The word Christmas is simply from our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers because it was the, it was the Mass of Christ. Every worship experience called a Mass, and it was the Mass of Christ. And so Christ, Christ, Mass. Christ Mass. That is where Christmas comes from.
And the first letter of Christ in Greek, anybody? It's the chi. What does it look like? An X. So if someone says Happy Xmas to you, or send you a card that says Xmas, they haven't taken Christ out of Christmas. That chi means Christ. They can think it's an X, but it's a chi. <laughs> That's what it is. So the only way Christ can get taken out of your Christmas is if you let everything else weigh you down and get focused on something else. If somebody says happy holiday to you, good for them. They're saying something, and they're saying it in a positive voice. Be happy. Don't worry about it. If you want to say Merry Christmas, say Merry Christmas. Let's stop arguing about the words we use and instead get back beyond those rules. When did we ever make it a rule? Did you see Jesus say, if you don't say Merry Christmas, ain't no Christmas coming? I don't see that in the gospel. Not even the gospel according to James. You can get away with saying happy holidays. And you know what? Holidays is from the word holy day. For us, every day is holy. You could say happy holidays year round if you want to. If you want to say Merry Christmas, you can say that year round too. <laughs> Whatever you want to say, just say it with the joy and love of Jesus in your heart. Because that's all God wants. You to love back the God that already loves you. And there ain't nothing you can do to stop it. God loved you before you were born and will love you after you die because love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13 told me that. Love never fails. Never, ever, ever fails. You are loved and you are meant to be loved. So I want you to sit down this week. I'm giving you a new assignment. Here we go. James added something to my page. He told me he was letting me let go, but now he wants me to add something. I want you to sit down with your pad, with a paper, with your journal, whatever, this week, and just journal the things that you think it takes to make a perfect Christmas. And be honest with yourself. Christmas is never quite the same because I don't make Grandma's cookies the same way. Christmas isn't Christmas because Grandma's not at Christmas this year. Christmas isn't Christmas for whatever reason. And then begin to go through the list and look at it. Do cookies really make Christmas? No. Do the stuff under the tree, you didn't get the perfect gift for somebody else? Guess what? There's no such thing as the perfect gift for somebody else. You can get a good gift for somebody else. But in the end, there's no such thing as a perfect gift. Stop beating yourself up. Christmas isn't about beating yourself up. I know people who leave the Christmas season relieved that, that it's over. Thank God Christmas is over. I don't want you to feel that way. I don't want to feel that way. We didn't do crazy Christmas this year. We didn't try, just because we have a building, to have a service every night of the week. James wouldn't speak to me anymore, and then Megan wouldn't speak to me because she never saw James. So, uh, you know, we didn't add as much as humanly possible to it just so we could say we had Christmas and we made it crazy. Do you remember what Christmas happened? In a stable, because there was no room anywhere else. It was as simple as you get. A manger, a feeding trough is where Jesus was born. So after you've made the list, cross off the things you really can live without. What do you really need for Christmas to be Christmas? And as the name implies, all you really need is Christ. And you've got it. So I hope you have someone to share it with. And I hope if not, you come and share it with us Christmas Eve, 7 p.m., the family service, 11 p.m., the acoustic unplugged Christmas contemplative service. I added a lot of extra words to it, but I don't know. Um, it'll shape out. Or join us for our online service this year. We're going to do an online longest night service. A longest night service is a night where we talk about how Christmas isn't always thrills and happiness. On the 21st, which is uh, winter solstice, the longest night of the year, longest night, we... 
We talk about the grief that comes at Christmas because someone's not at the table that used to be there or around the tree. We talk about the grief that comes at Christmas because something is broken and it's not fixed. And we stop denying it in the joy, joy, happiness of Christmas. And we say, you know what? Sometimes Christmas is sad for us because somebody's not here that used to be or somebody's or we're not with those people or we're far away. It's on the 21st. It's an online service. I've locked us into it now, James. James and I had a sort of plan. Now we're locked in. (laughs) 